it says this is being live streamed. Okay, meeting is live streaming. So I'll start re uh, recording, Professor Rohan. Yes, absolutely. And um, uh, uh, I think people can hear us perhaps. Um, uh, so we'll uh, just check how many folks have joined us. Yeah, 14 of us here and two more joining. And uh, Rahul, are we live on YouTube? Yes, ma'am, we are live. Great. Yes, um, so three o'clock. Professor O'Hanlon, over to you. Yes. So I'm I'm uh, I'm just thinking, <clears throat> everyone, we might um uh, give people a couple more minutes to join, to find the link and to to join. So the participants of uh, I see going up all the time. So that's very good. Um uh, so I'm uh, very happy to see you all. Um and uh, before I start the formal proceedings and share my screen, <clears throat> I just um, wondered if you had seen the uh, information that um, uh, was sent out to you yesterday about the historical novelist Hilary Mantel. Um, and uh, you should find the links there if you're interested in her work, um, because it does deal with exactly the same issues that we were talking about yesterday. Admittedly, in the context very much of British Tudor history, um, but she has these sort of wonderful reflections on what it is like as a serious historical novelist to do, to do research, but also to enter into the imaginations of her characters, the real historical characters she deals with as an act of imagination. And what she, <clears throat> What she talks about is the body. Um, she sees her job as a, as a person of literature, particularly to focus on the body, the sensations of the body, the immediacy of the body's presence in the world. When you're trying to write a historical um, novel, but very much as a novelist rather than as, as, as a historian. So for those of you who are interested, um, I, I do urge you when you have a moment, perhaps just to pursue one of those links and um, to just give it a little bit of time to, uh, uh, to get, get her accent. Um, uh, and uh, I promise you'll be rewarded. It was one of the, the, one of the few moments when I almost had a minor car accident because I was listening to this on the radio in the car a few years ago. And I was so interested that I didn't realize the car in front of me had stopped. So I had to uh, stamp on the brakes. So that is, a, that is a, t a testimony, I think, to what a very fascinating um, a, a set of um, interviews those are. Well, now we should uh, get underway. So I will share my screen. Um, here we go. Um, and I will start my slideshow. Uh, uh, so here we are. Um, uh, and welcome everyone to the second of our five lectures on literature, history, and the post colonial. Um, today we're going to be looking at Mughal history. Um, and this phrase that some of you will be familiar with, others perhaps less so, um, early modernity. Um, now, um, uh, I, I particularly would like uh, today, um, those of you perhaps who didn't have a question yesterday or had a question but didn't want to put your hand up because you thought your question was not appropriate or um, uh, uh, please do join the discussion. Um, it's no question is too, too obscure or too basic or too off, off beat to ask. So please, if you haven't joined the discussion yet, do, do raise your hand uh, or send in a question in the chat box during, um, the, uh, during the lecture. Uh, and we will be, be particularly, if we can, looking out for people uh, to welcome to the discussion um, uh, uh, for the first time. So just a quick recap from yesterday. 
uh, the insights from yesterday um, uh, about this term post-colonial, post-colonial approaches. Um, and here in the, the four bullet points, I've just tried to summarize the takeaways from yesterday's lecture. The aims of post-colonial approaches are to open our studies to a wider range of voices and perspectives, to remove Europe as the constant point of reference in our studies of societies outside Europe. Focusing on those societies to find new ways to reconstruct their historical trajectory, freed of implicit models derived from the European experience, and particularly the sort of all dominating uh, model of the history of the nation state. So how might these aims help us in the study of India's Mughal past? Um, and you'll see in the two images there something about what I'm going to talk about, the shift uh, in place names uh, that we see everywhere today in India, uh, which uh, in, in many cases are attempting to sideline or erase India's Mughal past. You will all be familiar here um, with uh, those attempts. Um, of course, the great episode of the Babri Masjid and the, uh, the, the rewritings of history uh, in some cases that that involved. You'll have seen the downplaying of Mughal history in schools and insert textbooks, and really a greater focus on the states of the, the, the Indian states of the 18th century, Shivaji, uh, Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj in Maharashtra, Maharana Pratap um, in um, Rajasthan, the renaming of roads to delete the names of Akbar and of, of Aurangzeb and now even Akbar, and railway stations as in the previous image. There's also the way in which the architectural heritage of Mughal India has been downplayed. Um, the, the traditional sites, the Taj Mahal, the, the Red Fort, Humayun's tomb, now are really rather downplayed in tourist literature and tourists are encouraged to visit uh, much more um, Hindu related sites. Um, in Yogi Adityanath's UP, the temples of Mathura and Banaras, and for some, not everyone, but for some, there's a suggestion that the Taj Mahal, although very beautiful, doesn't have very much of a connection with India's own indigenous culture. So in all sorts of ways, and here I'm really telling you, um, uh, sharing with you things that are, are familiar to you, um, in many ways, non-Hindus have been sidelined from the national pantheon. There was um, President Modi's rather infinite reference um, uh, some years ago in a presidential address to 1200 years of slave mentality, the implication being that <clears throat> the Gurids, Ghaznavids, Sultanate rulers, the Mughals themselves were all essentially foreigners in India, and really an emphasis on the intolerance and repression of these regimes and the dimension really of, of conflict between Hindus and Muslims uh, in pre-colonial India. Um, so those are some points about the politics of history. Others, it's worth noticing that there are growing parallels with the way that Pakistan treats its history, really mapping its own national past onto its Muslim history. It's curious that Pakistan really doesn't accept non-Muslims into its hall of nationalist heroes. It doesn't celebrate its important Buddhist history before the coming of Islam. The history of Pakistan begins with the coming of Islam into Sindh. So it excludes older histories of its second capital city, Lahore. It excludes its important Sikh ruler, Ranjit Singh of Lahore. Bharat Singh, the great martyr of Indian independence, had his home in Lahore, and this is simply not mentioned as a part of Pakistan's history. <clears throat> and, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> there's also, I think, a recent trend to celebrate Mughal rulers such as Aurangzeb. Um, the historian I.H. Qureshi criticized Akbar for what he said was Akbar's tolerance that alienated Muslims and weakened the empire. Moin ul Haq, the Secretary of Pakistan's Historical Society, argued that actually Aurangzeb was doing nothing other than 
defending the ideal Islamic way of life uh, during his reign. So it's not just India that takes up these modern um, uh, political agendas and projects them back in time. Other states um, in the region do it uh, as well, notably Pakistan. So let's turn now to look at the way that um, some historians have treated um, this juxtaposition between tradition and modernity. It's not uh, worth remembering, it's not just the older generation of Orientalist studies that identified uh, Mughal India with, as it were, tradition. Uh, this, this very remarkable work, uh, which is there um, in your, um, in your, uh, 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 on the screen in the image, um, uh, the Say Mutakarin, um, which was written by um, the son of an Irani noble in Mughal service um, uh, in 1789. He became a servant um, to Ali Verdi Khan in Bengal and then, enjoyed, then joined the East India Company as a munshi. And his book is um, a very interesting account of the petty corruption of India's uh, princes, but also the great shortcomings of Bengal's East India Company rulers. And he evokes what he says is the traditional ethic of administrative bureaucratic integrity associated that he sees there in Mughal service. For him, that is tradition, India as tradition. In a very different way, as argued by the uh, British scholar, Robert Travers in his book, Ideology and Empire, um, some servants of the East India Company justified the company's expansion on the grounds that it was restoring an ancient Mughal constitution, which had sort of gone, uh, had, had disintegrated and, and been lost. And um, now the company's role was actually restoring it. So there again, a different way of thinking, of identifying India with the realm of tradition. Um, now, those of you following the English slides, would you just move to the next one? Because I have repeated some material there. If you're following the Marathi slides, the material is done correctly. Um, again, in this line, these ways of identifying India as the realm of tradition, we have um, the great works of translation of Persian histories, notably Eliot and Dowson's eight volume work, The History of India as Told by Its Own Historians. And here the emphasis is very much the oriental despotism of Muslim rulers. Others by contrast, such as James Todd, who, the great scholar of, of Rajput history, he emphasizes another kind of tradition, but it's a warrior tradition, the virtuous warrior tradition of uh, the Rajputs. Now, not everybody um, thought, identified India as a land of tradition. Interestingly, Sir Jadonath Sarkar, who of course collaborated very closely with British historians, argued that in fact, Mughal rule was India's chance at modernity. Um, uh, the, 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 the rational um, nature of Mughal bureaucratic administration could have been the vehicle to carry India, a united India forward to become an independent nation state. But um, this was derailed by Aurangzeb's um, uh, uh, ultra traditionalist approach. Others, us more straightforwardly identifying India or the Mughal era as the realm of tradition. Of course, you'll all be familiar with the Marxist school of Irfan Habib um, at, in Aligarh. Uh, Habib, who of course saw the Mughal state just as a giant revenue sponge, sucking wealth from agrarian society until it was brought down by peasant uprisings. Now, interestingly, and I think really uh, rather a pity, subaltern studies really didn't do, uh, didn't focus very much on Mughal India at all. There are one or two articles, but its model was squarely the colonial regime. So 
subaltern studies really didn't challenge this whole tradition modernity dichotomy. Um, and uh, it's only really from the 1980s, again, under the impact of post-colonial critiques, <clears throat> that we get this tradition dichotomy, tradition modernity dichotomy seriously brought under challenge. Now, um, the idea of the early modern was central to these critiques. So let's, <clears throat> let's look now at what we mean by the early modern. And here we are very much indebted. We move from Dipesh Chakravarti, whose work we explored in depth yesterday, to another uh, extraordinary historian um, of um, pre-colonial India, India <clears throat> Sanjay Subramaniam, whose work, whose name will, I'm sure, be familiar to all of you. Now, um, Sanjay's um, article is there for you in your readings for, for uh, today, so I hope you've looked at it. <clears throat> I'll just recap here the, the um, main elements of that argument so that you, you get your heads around it. If, like me, at first you're thinking, how does this all fit together? So um, what is meant by the early modern, in a nutshell, is the world's first real era of globalization. So the modern in that phrase alludes to globalization. And of course, as you all know, it's really in the period about 1500 to 1750, particularly starting with the discovery of the so-called discovery of the Americas, and then uh, the arrival of the European trading companies in India and China. This is really um, a point in the world's history when a whole range of new kinds of connectedness are established. And through its trade, India was absolutely at the heart of this process. So what kinds of connectedness are we talking about? Uh, and here, let us quickly recap what Subramaniam argues in that article I hope you've read. Um, <clears throat> first, of course, through exploration, there is a much, there is a new sense of the boundaries of the inhabited world. Um, uh, Voyages of exploration made that clear. And of course, along with that, we have the emergence of new literary genres, uh, particularly the travel account. So we get that, um, that new genre coming very much to the fore. And of course, what helps to carry it throughout the world is print. Print technology, which is becoming widely disseminated from the early 1500s uh, throughout Europe is already known there in China and parts of Asia. So that's number one. Number two is something which sounds a little bit abstract, but um, is actually very concrete, which is um, more serious structural conflicts between those parts of particularly the Eurasian subcontinent, I mean, the Eurasian continent, um, conflicts between settled agricultural and urban societies, wealthy, settled, not particularly well armed, and nomadic hunter and pastoralist groups who from their homes, very largely on the steppes of Asia, um, eyed these wealthy, settled agricultural societies um, with great interest and, and um, uh, uh, very much an agenda for raiding um, and um, their own enrichment. And of course, the Turkic invasions from Northwest India through Northwest India are, are an example of that. Brings me to number three. Um, uh, and that, of course, is a, an enormous trading revolution. All sorts of things come together at this time to create these forms of connectedness in the early modern world. Obviously, new world silver, and I'll have a something to say about that in a moment. A whole set of other things, advances in shipbuilding and map making, cartography, which makes possible not just voyages of exploration, but the development of new commodity trades, cloth, cash crops, um, uh, spices, opium, cotton, sugar, tea. So not just 
um, artisan craft manufacturers like cross cloth, but raw materials. And interestingly, these are raw materials that require huge amounts of labor. So how is this labor acquired? Well, it's acquired through the development of early forms of slaving, uh, and then of course, um, in the transatlantic slave trade itself. Um, so all of this requires new military technologies, new modes of force to protect the enormous profits of those trades. Um, so going on with Subramanian's list, um, in this era, India, as I think I said in the last lecture, India is absolutely the workshop of the world. Um, uh, it has a, a very long coastline opening to the Indian Ocean world on either sides. Um, its states, all of its states, um, are keen to attract merchants. Their economies are long accustomed to the use of cash and credit. And um, of course, the specialization of labor, which in a way the caste system created in India <clears throat> was one of the things that helped develop very high grade craft, high grade craft manufacturers. A further point, uh, and this of course is something which again is part of a global condition, not just something that was happening in India. And that is the emergence of new kinds of bureaucratic state and empire. People, uh, states who were beginning to use the technology of paper, and skilled scribal people to do something that was absolutely vital to states of that period. And that was to create records of property rights. Why? Because if you know who owns property, then you are in a much better position to tax them and to raise revenues for the state thereby. Um, and of course, those revenues are all important because of the rising costs of military competition. And in this period, again, India is very much at the heart of things. India is an absolute magnet for skilled scribal people, state builders, people who know how to move money around, people who know how to create um, accounts. Um, and India draws in people uh, from across Asia uh, with these skills. Again, um, uh, another aspect of this global condition of early modernity, a rather different aspect, cultural aspect, are new ideologies of universal empire. All of these places that the, the uh, European Habsburgs, the Ottomans, the Safavids, the Mughals, uh, Ming and Qing China, Tokugawa, Japan, all of them, I mean, curiously to our modern eye, all of them, regarded themselves as empires whose power and um, reputation and identity could have no limits. They were universal empires. They all of them, very many of them created their own new calendars to mark the reinvention of time, the, the centrality of the emperor to, um, uh, to, to, to these imperial structures. So again, we have that this phenomenon uh, emerging in, in the world at the same time. Also in the cultural sphere, we have, this is very much a time of the emergence and global flow of new missionary orders, the Franciscans, the Dominicans, the Jesuits, of course, uh, in the Christian world, Sufi orders in the, in the Islamic world. Um, and of course, there is the millenarian conjuncture um, of uh, the Islamic world, um, 1000 um, AH, um, which parallels the Western Catholic sense of that this is a place we are living through the end times. So all of these things, this global form of connectedness, which predates our own modern era of globalization, um, uh, helps to displace our way, uh, that older way that we had of thinking about the world, which is in terms of a contrast between tradition and modernity. In fact, if we look at the world through this lens of connectedness, um, we see 
that what we now call modernity, which is effectively globalization, um, that modernity had multiple sources and points of origin in this early modern era. Modernity isn't, on this view, something that is, as it were, invented in Europe and then dispersed to the rest of the world. So moving on, I said I was going to say something a little bit more about silver. Um, uh, all of you will know that uh, it was under the Emperor Akbar that India was most successfully able to make the transition to a cash economy. A cash economy is something that is very difficult to sustain. That's to say farmers paying their dues to the state in cash, merchants trading in cash. That is very difficult to sustain if your, if your society is short of bullion, of the raw materials to make coin. Uh, notably of silver and gold, but particularly um, of silver. Um, uh, India, of course, was very short of silver bullion um, until this period. Um, and it was absolutely the Spanish discovery, you'll see there on the left of your slide, the Spanish discovery of the enormous silver deposits at Potosi in Peru um, that transformed the global situation. By 1575, half of the world's silver came from this one mine. Um, and we see this silver th flowing through the arteries of global trade um, and making that transition to cash away from barter, paying your taxes in kind, to paying it in money, in coin, that was what made this possible. And so that really um, was uh, a very major um, factor in sustaining the enormous expansion of trade, both within India and around India, that we see characterizing the Mughal era. Um, and I've shown you some images there of coins from the um, uh, Sher Shah Suri's era, which came to be the basis uh, for Mughal currency. These are the silver coins, as you can see, have uh, both have both Arabic and Devnagri um, characters on them. These are workaday coins. Um, here you have some of Jahangir's gold mohurs, uh, which of course are, are ceremonial. Um, uh, uh, these are not things that you take shopping in the market uh, at all. But so central to this whole era, this whole I, um, uh, new condition of global connectedness is silver. Um, and and uh, uh, that uh, I think is very important to appreciate. But this, these lectures are not so much about the material foundation for all of these things, but these lectures are more about culture, about knowledge. So let us ask this question. If we can see all of these global connections and unities across the world, did this mean that the worlds of early modern India and of the Europeans who knew about it, that these worlds were, were, were mutually translatable? Does do the connections of trade and the material world translate? Um, uh, are they also reflected in the world of culture? Now, um, these um, I've sketched out here some different positions. Um, and these are in part um, uh, uh, the, the work of Cohn and Pinch is there in your readings for today. Um, uh, for um, I, I haven't set you to read Chris Bailey um, because in a way I think William Pinch summarizes his argument. Um, uh, Cohn's position is that these worlds were not mutually comprehensible. Um, he argues um, that the coming of the East India Company, he says, was an invasion of epistemological space. Um, British ways of clarifying, th of, of um, excuse me, uh, uh, British ways of um, classifying people and things was fundamentally alien. It was based on a drive to bureaucratic classification, commercial judgments about people and things, 
It was about surveillance. It was about knowledge gathering as a tool to control. Indians, on the other hand, Cohn argued, lived in a world of, of what he called substances, um, a world very much of bodies, a world uh, very much of um, in which political and religious authority were constructed through things. So what could he mean there? Well, of course, one of the things he means is court culture. Um, uh, if we think about Mughal court ceremonial, and we'll look at an image of that in a moment, um, the gift of ceremonial robes from the Mughal emperor to lesser lords wasn't just a gift of robes. It wasn't just a gift, a, a ceremonial gift of, of, of a costume. The assumption was also that by gifting robes that the emperor himself had had on his shoulders, you were also passing some element of imperial substance to the client ruler. Um, uh, and, and this is what Cohn means when he talks about a world of substances. Um, when the East India Company saw these um, ceremonies, you know, one of the, they did make, they did draw some very strange conclusions. Uh, we have an account in which one ambassador writes back saying, aren't these Mughals cheapskates? You know, they have all this wealth. And when it comes to giving ceremonial robes to their um, lesser lords, they give them secondhand cast offs. Um, so in a way they, they didn't see that symbolic side of the transaction. So th that is something very much in favor of the view that th these are very different ways of thinking about people and things. Now, Bailey, again, I, know, I didn't suggest you read it, but just to mention some of the points here that he talks about, um, uh, he, he suggests that in fact, Indian states, including the Mughal state, had their own forms of knowledge gathering. Um, he mentions four empirical knowledge like Mughal state gazetteers, um, uh, a kind of spiritual forms of spiritual anthropology, which he, to which he points accounts of uh, religious sects. Something um, he, he talks about another class of, of early modern knowledge in Mughal India, which he labels a moral ecology, by which he means a kind of fascination with marvels and an, and an attempt to read moral lessons into them. And then he mentions genealogy, family history. So he argues that in fact, Mughal attempts at knowledge gathering were also in their own ways essentializing, that, these, that this is not simply um, a, a facet of Western forms of knowledge gathering. And William Pinch, whose uh, article I hope you've read, really supports Bailey's argument. Um, and he, he, for Pinch, he thinks that if you look at, at diplomatic exchanges, for example, there is a great deal about each side um, that each did understand. Um, and here he takes as his example, um, to, um, the East India Company's ambassador, Sir Thomas Rowe, who visited the Mughal court in the early 17th century. And his argument is that both sides actually knew perfectly well, pretty much what they were about. And so if we look here at an image of Jahangir's court with in fact, Sir Thomas Rowe there, and if we look at the letter that Jahangir wrote um, to send back home uh, to, um, uh, to, to the king, um, you can see very much that, um, that, that there's a very clear understanding about what kings should say to each other. Here in this image, you see um, Rowe's court, uh, you see Jahangir's court, and there, um, towards the bottom left, you will see Sir Thomas Rowe himself wearing a, a beard, a, a very characteristic Elizabethan white ruff around his neck, no headgear, of course, and there he's holding um, a book. Um, uh, and here you can see Jahangir translation of Jahangir's letter to um, uh, back to the king. Um, and um, he says, when your majesty shall open this letter, let your royal heart be as fresh as a sweet garden. 
Let all people make reverence at your gate. Let your throne be advanced higher um, amongst the greatness of the kings of the prophet Jesus. Let your majesty be the greatest and all monarchies derive their counsel and your wisdom and their wisdom from your breast as from a fountain that the law of the majesty of Jesus may revive and flourish under your protection. And as you can see, and I won't read the second part, you can see he continues in this vein. So that I think is very much evidence for the quite high degree of understanding that this meeting of diplomats in a royal court um, shows to us. Let's move um, to look at the same question in a rather different context, a context that will be familiar to many of you. Um, again, we have a diplomat and our diplomat is Henry Oxenden. And Henry Oxenden um, has the extraordinary um, sort of privilege um, uh, and a, a unique privilege of being the only person um, who has left behind um, from his own eyewitness, a detailed account of the consecration of Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj in June um, 1674. And, and here you can see a picture of Oxenden. He was later deputy governor of Bombay. And underneath there we have a Dutch engraving of Chhatrapati Shivaji, which was done during the Chhatrapati's lifetime. So we can be confident it's fairly accurate. And here we have part of, um, on, the, on the right, we have part of the narrative of Henry Oxenden um, uh, in a later reprint. Um, now, what's interesting here is the high degree of understanding on both sides. So Oxenden has come hoping to um, agree a commercial treaty with the Maratha court at Raigad, with, with Shivaji, uh, Chhatrapati Shivaji's court. Um, he wants a, a peace treaty so that the company can trade safely after earlier Maratha raids on the company's factories. Um, uh, and he also understands very well that he won't get any access to um, the king without going through the king's own officers. Here there are intermediaries, um, uh, Niraji Pandit and Narayan Shenvi, a two that Oxenden, that, that are kind of clearly designated to look after Oxenden. He understands he has to work through them. <clears throat> and he also understands that he's turned up in Raigad right on the eve of the Maharaja's consecration by accident. Um, so he understands he has to wait. These two emissaries say to him, I'm sorry, you can't see him, he's busy. Um, so, um, uh, on that side, there's very clear mutual understanding. Um, now, what is Oxenden able to gain here? Um, he's able to gain a sort of broad assurance that the company's trade is welcome in the Maratha dominions. Um, but two of his key requests are actually refused. First, and you'll, you know, you will be rather breathtaking. Uh, you'll draw breath at the, the cheek, the, the, um, the arrogance, if I can put it that way, of the company's request. That the company first said, and here we come back to the importance of money, of coin, the company first said that it would like its coins to circulate in the Maratha domains as the official coin. Um, and uh, you must remember at that time, there were very many different mints striking coins, and that made trade quite difficult because how could you compute the difference between coins from different mints? Um, but the Rygood court refused this. The company's coins are welcome to circulate, but there will be no, you won't have any status as, as the official coin. If people want to use your coin, fine. Uh, no problem. The company also asked for a particular privilege. It wanted um, a guarantee that any company sh ship wrecked on the coast or taken by pirates would be restored to the company. And again, that was refused 
on the grounds that, well, if we give you that, every other European trading company will want the same privilege and we're, we're treating you all alike. Um, so Oxenden failed with those two requests, but he came away with a very deep impression of the importance of this historic ceremony, the consecration of the Chhatrapati. He says, I took notice that on each side of the throne there hung, according to the Moors manner, he calls uh, Indians Moors here, um, there hung on heads of gilded lances, many emblems of government and dominion. As on the right hand were two great fishes, two great fishes, heads of gold with very large teeth. Of course, a fish in this context was very much a symbol of royal authority. On the left were, were several horses' tails, a pair of gold scales on a very rich lance head, lance head poised equally, an emblem, he says, of justice. And as we returned to the palace gate, there were standing two small elephants, elephants on each side, again symbols of royalty, and two fair horses with gold bridles and rich furniture, rich trappings. So Oxenden understands very well here that this is not some country lord um, uh, bigging himself up, that this is a very serious and very successful uh, consecration replete with a whole range of symbols of royalty drawn not just within the Indian subcontinent, but symbols of royalty that would be understood right across Asia. Um, <clears throat> let's look a little bit more closely at some of these understandings and some of these negotiations um, between the East India Company and the Maratha state. Um, and there is, a, there is very interesting material here in um, the, uh, 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 the text that was commissioned by Sambhaji Maharaj of Kolhapur from Ramchandra Pant Amatya, uh, the very eminent statesman diplomat at successive Maratha courts. Um, <clears throat> and um, Ramchandra, Ramchandra Pant was asked to outline what, so that future generations know this, what were the principles of Shivaji's state? Um, and this was written about 1715, of course, after the death of Shivaji, and on the era of a new Maratha state being established in Satara. And so it was clear that Sambhaji wanted that person who was a repository of so much experience to write that experience down so that future generations could benefit from it. Now, um, Ramchandra Pant's um, a text, which we call a work of Rajaniti or state policy, said a number of very interesting things, which again touches on these principles of cross-cultural understanding. Domestic merchants, he said, were to be respected. They were to be encouraged, those both within Maratha domains and those from elsewhere in the subcontinent. Suitable places should be assigned for their markets and shops. These people are valuable to us. We should respect them. But he said, and you will admire the man's foresight here, European merchants were different. They serve the interests of foreign masters and their aim will always be territorial expansion. He says, in, and this is in the text that you have read, the, one of the primary sources for today, their masters, every one of them are ruling kings. By their orders and under their control, these people come to trade in, our, in these provinces, our provinces. So he advises, great caution was needed in giving any concessions to them. He says, they should strictly never be given places to settle. If a place has sometimes to be given for a factory, it should not be given at the mouth of an inlet on the, or on the shores of the sea, because of course that was where the company's strength was greatest. What he's suggesting is if you want to give them a, a trading base, make it inland so that they can't then be supported by um, ships with guns. He says, their strength lies in navy, 
guns and ammunition. He also says they shouldn't be allowed to build permanent, that's to say strong or fortified houses. You shouldn't let them fortify um, uh, any of these trading bases. So there you have a very clear right understanding of not so much um, uh, 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 you, you have a broad understanding of the agenda, both with which East India Company agents arrived and also of the expansionist ideology that was then important in, at, the, at the Elizabethan uh, 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 court. Um, and there are many other liter interesting literary genres which show the same degree of understanding. There's a very famous um, text called the Shiva Bharata by Shivaji Maharaja's court poet, Kavindra Paramananda, a Sanskrit poem, which praises Shivaji for his strength in standing up to these um, European trading states who sought to dominate from the sea. So again, a very good, some very good instances of cross-cultural understanding here emerging out of a really a shared world of military and diplomatic competition. Now, um, so those are some things about a shared world, which the, um, the perspective of the early modern helps us to understand. Let me, as I move towards my close, let me just touch on um, uh, uh, a related um, field and a, a field which of course is very controversial and sensitive. That's to say the field of religion and the emphasis, the way in which um, very many um, political and cultural agendas today project backwards present day communal tensions uh, onto the Mughal era. Um, now, some of you will be familiar with the work of Richard Eaton and Bruce Lawrence, Beyond Turk and Hindu. You can see the book illustrated there. And their argument, um, I'll just I briefly summarize it here for you, is that the episodes of temple destruction, which we saw in the Mughal era, was, um, when, was not primarily a religious act. Um, the Mughal emperors, particularly Aurangzeb, didn't on the whole go after Hindu kingdoms, Hindu temples, which associated with rulers that were not a threat to them. Um, they went after the temples of rulers um, that were. So the destruction of the great temple to um, uh, Vishveshwar, to, to, to the Lord Shiva um, in Benares in 1669, um, the suggestion is that that temple was destroyed because it was associated with the Maratha state. It was very much, that temple was very much the base for a lot of priests and pundits from Maharashtra that were associated with Shivaji's court. And of course, by the late 1660s, Shivaji is very much a, a thorn in Aurangzeb's side. And the, so the, the, the suggestion is here that that temple destruction was a political act, primarily a political act, because the temple is associated, a king's authority is in part vested in his temples, in temples associated with his priests uh, and his pundits. Um, uh, now, I think things are perhaps not quite as simple as that, but this seems to me a, a, an important and very useful a point of argument when we're trying to engage with that reading of history back into time from, the, from our own present day. Another work that again, you may be very familiar with um, is this work of um, Audrey Trushka's Culture of Encounters. And here she's really um, tracing the ways in which um, Sanskrit uh, learning was encouraged by the Mughal court. Um, and, and this again, is it, it's very clearly there in the records, um, Sanskrit learning underwent an enormous revival under the Mughals. That there is simply, if you look at the record, there is simply no getting away from that fact. And then lastly, um, uh, 
uh, as, as one of many pieces of evidence about the ways in which the Mughals were actually rather selective in the way that they targeted temples. For some temples, um, they actually uh, extended support. And here you have a Mughal imperial grant in both Sanskrit and Persian to temples in Matara and Vrindavan. Um, so again, the picture is much more complicated than, than we normally, um, uh, we might be led to believe. Um, so here, <clears throat> the perspective of, of, um, of post-colonialism, the, the, the uh, argument that we shouldn't, that we should step back from tradition moder modernity dichotomies, that we should step back from present, present day national agendas and try to examine the evidence as it survives. These perspectives are very helpful to us, I think, in um, exploring some of these questions. So some conclusions, um, uh, some uh, summaries. Um, to reiterate, the post-colonial perspective of what we call early, moder early modernity helps us escape from that old, tired, dichotomy of tradition modernity. India represents tradition, Europe represents modernity. The early modern centuries were, uh, roughly speaking, 1500 to 1750, were the world's first great era of globalization. And modernity, we here define as the global flows of people, commodities, ideas, technologies. We might also mention diseases, um, uh, uh, and other uh, material um, uh, 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 things. Uh, these had many points of origin in Asia as well as Europe. So this perspective, I think, does a lot to help us to study the states and societies of pre-colonial India, really on their own terms. Um, we set aside uh, Europe and European derived models we see connections between different kinds of history and we broaden the genres that we use as historical sources. This is also a good way of freeing ourselves from the demands of present day politics, which sometimes project their own concerns back into the past. But of course, as all good, as all good answers do, they raise, these raise further questions. What in the end was it that propelled the East India Company to political dominance in the region. Um, and, and this is what we're going to look at next time. How do these insights of post-colonialism allow us to reconceptualize what it meant to be a colonial subject? Um, and that's really going to be very much the, the focus for next time. So that brings me to the end of my, um, my uh, uh, lectures and I will stop sharing my slides now. I can always get them back up if need be. Um, so um, let me uh, invite questions. You're very welcome to put your hands up. Um, uh, Shraddha will help me watch out for um, questions coming in through the chat box. And as I say, please, those of you who didn't have a chance to ask questions last time or didn't simply have questions last time, please do, don't hesitate to raise your hands and you would be most welcome to join the discussion. Um, Shraddha, can I leave it to you now? Sure, to, yes. Sure. Um, uh, there's already a raised hand from Devasmita and Nabila. <laughs> okay, Devasmita, go ahead. Oh. Hello, ma'am. Thank you for the uh, lecture. Uh, ma'am, I just wanted to share an, an anecdote about uh, something. I mean, you talked about erasing histories and erasing the contribution of the non-Hindus in the Indian subcontinent. Mm -hmm. And it reminded me of a small incident that happened yesterday. Mm -hmm. As you might know, it was International Mother Tongue Day. And uh, it 
uh, we all know the history of the International Mother Language Day, right? So why uh, the sacrifices made in Bangladesh and everything. So mm -hmm. yesterday in social media, I came across a, a post where one of my Muslim friends put up the names of the martyrs who died in that battle for mother tongue and battle, to, uh, battle for their right to speak their mother tongue. So on one hand, um, at least in the Indian subcontinent, there has been erasing of the names of the martyrs who died for their mother language mm -hmm. on the other hand there are muslims who are asserting uh, the uh, these histories of the names of the martyrs and uh, i also saw uh, some uh, right wing uh, people attacking these people who are naming the martyrs mm -hmm. even though in their own context they are celebrating international mother tongue day and how we are proud of our mother tongue and everything but obviously the names of the martyrs cannot come because they are Muslim names. Yeah. So this yeah. duality, the one on one hand, trying to erase the history of the names and asserting it in the context of the new kind of India that is we are seeing right now. Well, that, that is, um, of course, what, what you describe <clears throat> is, is very much um, what, what we've been talking about. And the trouble with social media um, is is that social media is not a good place to have conversations. As, as, as far as I can see, an awful lot of social media involves echo chambers in which people listen only to people who agree with them, except when they're shouting at people who don't agree with them. Um, uh, now, I, not being really a social media person myself, I'm not of that generation, I don't know quite how you, you know, how you respond to that. Um, you know, if, if you were to put out what you've said, would that result in you being cancelled by lots of people or lots of poisonous critique being addressed at you? And I, you're a young person and younger people will have a much better idea how to handle that whole situation. But it, it is, you know, it, it is this condition that we're in, which I do believe, I'm afraid, is exacerbated by social media which is that people talk past each other. They're not interested in listening. They're interested in putting the strongest um, statements out there because strong statements are what attracts the attention of other people. You know, these are not primarily people who are interested in conversations, who are interested in listening. Um, so thank you for that, um, uh, uh, Nabila. So let's move on to, now what I'm going to do um, if only there's two questions from people who haven't had the opportunity to ask. Thank you very much. So Neerti and Park. Neerti, please do go ahead. Thank yes. You. Yes. Hi, ma'am. I uh, hope you're doing well. And thank you. Uh, thank you for the uh, very engaging lecture. So um, according to me, when I read uh, Ramachandra Pant Amatya's text, he seems to have a very nuanced understanding of colonialism since he mentions that European races were obstinate in acquiring territories and not giving up control. So mm -hmm. I wanted to know that, will this be an anachronistic assumption on my part that he has a very nuanced understanding of colonialism? And also since we were talking about um, reading sources against the grain, so how generally does one steer clear of making anachronistic assumptions when we analyze primary sources? Well, um, I mean, what, you know, what you, the best way to steer clear of those assumptions is by understanding the context in which he was writing, understanding his experiences as, as, as a statesman, uh, which had been over many generations dealing with the, the East India Company of Bombay. Um, uh, in its East India Company at its base in Bombay. And there it was, the, you know, it's, it's the, the, the oldest company uh, base in India. Um, six, you know, there are very significant merchant communities attached very close to the, the Bombay government who are forever saying these, you know, these Marathas that are always disturbing trade, they're always raiding our factories, you know, for goodness sake, deal with them once and for all. And so that's his experience. Now, where in a sense, I would think that his experience is rather less of a guide to the, the broader agendas pursued by the East India Company over 1750 to 1820, 
um, is that, um, well, two or three things. One is that um, there was not um, a preconceived blueprint for Indian empire in 1750. Um, a great deal of the company's expansion happened because of decisions made by people on the imperial frontier. Um, quite a lot of that expansion happened <clears throat> because the company found willing allies, uh, particularly amongst merchant and banking communities. Um, those of you who know the company's history in 1750s Bengal will know that um, uh, uh, Suraj Dawla was, was displaced as a, as a result of an alliance between um, the Jagatshets, the Omichans, the banking communities of, of Calcutta, yeah. who would stand to lose an awful lot, who were fed up with Suraj Dawla because he kept renouncing his debts. And also, if the company were exiled from Calcutta, were thrown out, they would lose access to their supplies of bullion. Um, that they would, you know, they would lose, lose an important trading partner. So um, the story of the company's rise to dominance, I mean, it will always be controversial. Um, uh, you know, for many people, uh, it's clear there was, a, there was a blueprint from the start. And perhaps, perhaps, not perhaps, certainly, there are imperial there are assumptions that the company brought with them to India, which although not apparent at the start, were in part what helped the company on its rise to its, its expansion as a political power. Um, so although there wasn't a blueprint, there are things there in company ideology, which meant that sooner or later, it was likely that it would go for empire. So um, of course, um, some of those things um, uh, Ramchandra Punt would have understood. Um, others he would not have done um, because he wasn't in a position to. Um, so I think, you know, a, an understanding of complexity is, is part of the order of the day. Um, but it is remarkable how, how far-sighted those, those observations were. Um, uh, so... Uh, now, any um, path hasn't asked a question. Am I right in thinking, Sroka? Um, uh, so yes, yes, Professor Hanlon. Also, a question from YouTube by Rahul Mani, which we will take after paths, perhaps. Path, please do ask your question. Yeah, thank you, Professor, for today's lecture. Now, my question was, since we are discussing the historical aspects of the early modern, can you put into perspective the position on the debate on the modern construction of Hinduism? which argues that what we, uh, what we uh, understand, much of what we understand as Hinduism currently is a modern construction resulting from a complex inter interaction between Christian missionaries, scholars associated with colonial power and native caste elites, and whether there are some continuities from the pre-colonial period to the what, what has now come to be understood as a uh, modern construction of Hinduism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Well, well I mean, <clears throat> as you would expect me to say, um, there is both continuity and change. Um, I certainly, <clears throat> excuse me, I certainly don't agree with the argument that 19th century Hinduism is simply a colonial construction. Of course it isn't. Um, uh, the, 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 um, there are many, there are very many aspects of what we now call Hindu religious practice um, observable in the early modern world, which still live in the present. You know, there are pilgrim networks, there are um, bhakti traditions, there are great texts. Um, uh, but at the same time, Hinduism has a history. There, there, is, there is a, you know, Hinduism doesn't live outside time. And the forms of history that the sort of historical um, dimension that we have to understand doesn't start with the coming of colonialism either. Um, there is, a, I think, a very longer term, really stretching back into classical times. There is a longer term 
process um, of the expansion of what we might call Brahmanic Hinduism, Hinduism which focuses on the idea of dharma, the idea of dharma as essentially an alliance between priests and kings, um, which alliance helps to safeguard dharma in the world. And you can see successive um, uh, 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 in, in successive eras of history, um, it became a kind of pan-continental, a pan-Indian language. If you were an aspirant king, what was it? What did you do to announce the fact of your ambitions? One of the things you did was to stage royal rituals in your territories to, um, uh, uh, to bring auspiciousness to your rule, to recognize your royal power. So you settled communities of Brahmins um, uh, with inams and, and um, uh, 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 lands given for the maintenance of the priests who would do your rituals. So that alliance between, between um, Brahmanic, between uh, priests um, steeped in Vedic and Dharmashastric learning and kings goes right back to the first millennium and in, some, in, in many ways earlier. And so that form, if you like, of Hinduism always hit against, or not hit against, but bumped up against forms of um, religious practice, um, such as sacrifices to the bloodthirsty gods of the forest margin. Um, uh, those forms of Hinduism sometimes experienced friction when it came to bhakti traditions. Um, uh, those forms of Hinduism that the, the king and priest uh, alliance also hit, hit up against forms of Hinduism in which, um, uh, in which the goddess was, was preeminent. Um, so I think what I would say is that the evidence of history is that what we can call Hinduism, because I don't know how else, what I think it's a reasonable thing to call Hinduism, um, is, is a plural tradition. It's a tradition with many strands. And at diff in different historical eras, different strands have been dominant. In our own era, um, the strand um, of, 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 of uh, what you might call Brahmanic Hinduism, but given very much a populist um, uh, complexion, that strand is dominant. Um, so on the one hand, um, I, I certainly don't think, I don't agree with the position that it was really colonialism that, en that um, uh, invented something called Hinduism. Um, uh, that, um, the, and the most helpful way to think about it is as a plural, Hinduism has always been a plural tradition. If there was, a, if there was um, an influence of uh, missionary Christianity, it was the attack that said, if you have a plural tradition, you are not a proper religion at all. And under the impact of those missionary attacks, of course, we get reformist forms of, of, of Hindu belief coming forward. Um, uh, we get um, uh, revivalist forms coming forward with rather different agendas later in the 19th century. Um, but so I think, you know, uh, I think your question is coming from a very good place. Um, and my answer is that Hinduism has never been timeless. It has always evolved historically. And it was, and I believe remains, a plural, an internally plural, historical tradition, and all the more healthy for that. Because where you have plurality, you have, di you have um, diversity, you have possibilities of debate, possibilities of conversations, possibilities of learning from others. Um, so I hope, Parth, that is a helpful answer to your question. <laughs>
Um, uh, thank now, uh, you, Professor Randall. Now we can move on to Rahul's question in the chat box. Rahul Mane uh, from YouTube, which Bhakura uh, has helpfully pasted here. Is Orientalism project of dominating East still ongoing in globalization and post-truth era? If yes, how? Uh, just a moment, just a moment. Uh, um, I'm just, uh, yes, sorry, I was just uh, not seeing the, the full list of questions. So this is, uh, is Orientalism a project of the domin of dominating the East still uh, ongoing in globalization and the post-truth era? Well, that's a kind of, um, uh, I mean, that is, is uh, of course there are, of, of course there are still um, niches, parts of, uh, of Western, constructions of Asia that, that deploy Orientalist tropes. Um, but um, I think uh, that, you know, the rise of India and China in the past 20 years has, has really changed the conversation. Um, I mean, that shifts at this level take a long time to happen. Um, but um, the rise of India and China, I think, and particularly the, the now the resurgence um, of, of Russia, um, we, we speak, of course, on a morning in which um, uh, there, it looks as though the war clouds, the clouds of war have gathered finally over Europe with the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, so we're all very serious on this side. Um, uh, I think all of these things, um, and particularly the, the experience, even the experience of the pandemic and the sense that Asian countries actually managed this much better than European countries did. Um, these are all things I think which move the conversation forward. Um, uh, 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 if I can, if I can uh, uh, put it like that. Um, now, who should we take next? Uh, yeah, uh, now there's a couple of messages in the chat box, one from Atira and one new message from Jatin. And I suppose Jatin has not asked a question. And there are a few raised hands as well, uh, but mm -hmm. these are the people who have uh, asked questions yesterday. So uh, as per your policy decision, uh, Jatin maybe should go first. Okay. Well, shall I um, want me to read his question? Uh, no, I have Jatin's question. Um, uh, let me just uh, let me just respond to Atira, and then I'll move to, to Jatin. I mean, Atira's is really a comment um, as much as a question, and um, of course, you know these are difficult times. You know, we are living in very difficult times. Um, uh, the phenomenon that you describe in Modi's India. Um, it is, is, I hope, well understood um, uh, in, in uh, the university world um, outside India. And um, it, it, is, it is very difficult. Uh, to, you know, one fe you feel that you are living in a kind of shrinking world. Um, there is no consolation, of course, in seeing that world now coming on so strongly in the United States. Um, those of you who follow US politics will know the crisis of American democracy that we saw early in January, 2021. And of course, um, the Republican Trump, the Trump led Republican party is now doing something very similar, both in, um, uh, in, um, at the local level structures for, for democratic, um, uh, for, for voting. Um, states across the US are trying to limit voting by making it harder and harder to register to vote at all. Um, and um, although in the US universities, many universities remain beacons of, um, of diversity, of, of scholarship, um, without being directly feeling political pressure in the way that I, I'm deeply aware Indian universities do. Um, 
you know, they also feel these same cold winds um, of, of the rolling back of democracy. Um, we, you know, we live in very difficult times uh, and um, it's a grief uh, to those of us who, um, who, who by the great good fortune of our lives somehow have, have find themselves uh, familiar with India, working on India, interested in India. It's a grief to us that um, we see these developments, even as we rejoice that in the last 30 years, so many Indian, um, uh, so many Indian communities have been lifted out of poverty and so many voices which were not heard before are now heard. Um, and so there are things to cheer, things to, to side with, uh, um, things to celebrate, um, even as we grieve for, for other things which, um, uh, which make the present time difficult. Um, and, uh, you know, in all sorts of ways, um, it will be interesting to see how these crises of democracy across the world, which is really, I think, what we're looking at, how these play out. India is the world's biggest democracy. Um, to India's great credit, if you if you think that democracy is the best of all the best of all worlds, you know, given that every other every other alternative is worse, as Winston Churchill said, um, uh, it is to India's great credit that it has never had a January the 6th moment, a moment where the party in power just refused to recognize the election. And I, I like to think, and I'm sure many of you will share this sentiment, I like to think that, that for all of the challenges to them, India's institutions, India's legal institutions, its political institutions, the diversity of its politics, the, the diversity of its states are some bulwark against that kind of challenge. Um, in a way, it is India's, as is often said, India's raucous democracy, which is the best safe, raucous political world of political voices, which I think are the best safeguard against another January the 6th type of moment in India. So Atira, uh, that's your question. Now, um, let me ask, answer one from YouTube. Um, uh, where was it? Uh, um, uh, 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 Shanta, was there? Yeah. Um, where we... uh, this comes from Bapura Gungarhapan. Right. Was, uh, the first one was uh, Rahul Mane that you have answered. Yeah, yes. Yeah. And then you have answered Athiras as well. Yeah. And uh, you have, uh, we'll uh, take up Jatin's question. Yep. Okay. Yeah, in the chat box. In the chat. Yes, I see that. Yeah. Um, yeah. Not uh, from YouTube. Uh, Rahul Manis was the only one from YouTube. Okay. Well, we'll keep an eye out as and when questions come in from YouTube. Yes. We'll yes. Keep an eye out and give them uh, give them a priority. Um, uh, so, Jatin, um, uh, uh, your first part is a statement. Um, uh, I was also curious to know that do we find traces of histories of caste-based communities in the major, sorry, local, histories of low caste communities in the narratives and written sources, particularly about untouchables? Yes, we do. Um, uh, I mean, there's a very, you know, we could talk about this question more on day five. But they're, they're, those of you who have had any experience um, looking at um, legal histories in pre-colonial India will know that something that we now rightly find abhorrent um, in the caste system, which is in Western India, in Maharashtra, we would call it the Maharwatan, uh, Maha traditional rights. Um, you uh, now, of course, those were rights, but they went with disadvantages and deprivations and humiliations that we cannot other than find abhorrent. But it's also worth remembering that there is this all this rather different history. So I'll give you an example. Um, 
And this is one which um, I, must, I must mention. Um, uh, 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 there is a, a very good friend of mine. I won't embarrass him, but he will know who he is, um, who is part of our discussion today, who helped me with a little bit of research that I did back in India a couple of years ago, looking at um, a, a, um, a land dispute um, in later 18th century Maharashtra. So it was a, it was a dispute about um, the boundaries of lands. And um, uh, the, the dispute was resolved, but there were two things about the dispute. One, um, it was a dispute um, that related to these Maha rights. And it was a dispute that regional communities took extremely seriously. Um, very many parties attended, very many different caste communities attended, state officials attended. It was widely recognized that these rights were important to the local society um, and that the correct resolution of, their, of these rights was to everybody's welfare. Um, I mean, I'm talking about contemporary systems of value. And in the documents that um, uh, these um, meetings of um, the local community and the, the signed documents that they produced, Mahars, the, the, the head of the Maha community was himself a signatory. Um, and um, so, you know, I'm not remotely suggesting that these are these in any slightest way take away from the long history of Maha and other Dalit deprivation, humiliation, abuses, marginalization, all of those things that we will be looking at on Friday. But it's worth uh, it's worth remembering that there is an there is the, it's not an alternative history, of course, it's not a history of privilege. It is simply a history of how those rights used to work. Um, and so you might say, well, why does that matter now? Because after all, it, it was no protection. Well, I think those rights matter. And here I'm trying to answer the second half of your question. Um, Jatin, um, it, it matters because it helps us to understand in the pre and early Ambedkar era, why it was that Mahars and other Dalit communities hung on to their rights for so long. Um, in those days, those rights were the few things as they saw it that they had going for them. And yet people like Ambedkar were suggesting they throw them over. Um, so, you, the answer to your question, Jatin, is that, that for those who care to look at the 18th century and earlier documents, there are certainly, and, and legal cases are the best source for this because untouchable, what we call now untouchable communities, were so often witnesses uh, to these, um, these legal proceedings. Um, uh, there are documents there if you're interested to look at them. Um, so now, who should we go to next? Um, uh, uh, Shraddha, we've got we've still got plenty of time. <laughs> yeah, uh, there's a, a question from Amol Bankar. Uh, ah, uh, Amol, <laughs> hello, nice to hear you. Um, uh, uh, now, your question here in the chat box. You have mentioned there are two subaltern works which focus on Mughal India. Uh, can you share more details? Um, I will do. Um, I will but I will tell you tomorrow. Um, uh, I will need to just pull out my subaltern studies texts. Um, there, there are two, that's my recollection, is that there are two. I think one of them's on, one of them may have been on banditry, but forgive my, my poor memory, Amol. I will try and pull them out and I will, I will um, pass them on to our participants tomorrow. But broadly speaking, the subaltern studies, as you all know, it, its agenda was not Mughal India. Um, and so it didn't take up these, these particular questions that we're talking about today. Um, now, who should we, um, who can we uh, take up? Next? Three patient ladies here, Nabila, yes. Harshita, and Anne Marie. <laughs> Nabila, please. <laughs> Right. So I had two very different questions to ask. Uh, 
the first being in reference to Henry Oxenden's account. And mm -hmm. he uses this term Moors, M-O-O-R-E-S, to describe the Indians. So I was wondering if you could perhaps tell us a little bit more about the different um, terminology used by Europeans as well as um, Indian indigenous groups in um, this period and what this can perhaps tell us about the nature of the cross-cultural cultural interaction here. And mm -hmm. secondly, I had a question um, regarding what I see as um, a major obstacle for us in South Asia um, trying to study history here. So basically how um, our access to resources is greatly limited and restricted because of the modern political boundaries um, within which we exist. So if you had perhaps any um, thoughts on which how one can perhaps tackle such obstacles in, the, in studying um, cultural interaction in South Asia across the geographical territories. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, thank you for those two questions, Nabila. Um, uh, both useful, important um, uh, questions. Um, the term, of course, <clears throat> you will know that different communities in this early modern era had all sorts of different terms from, for one another. Um, you know, something that is, is uh, many of you will know, um, uh, in the Mughal era, people on the whole didn't refer to Mughals, uh, didn't refer to Muslims as Muslims. They called them Turks, Turk, Turushka. Um, uh, they, they called Europeans Ferengis, which is basically a corruption of the word um, Frank, uh, French. Um, uh, now, the, the Oxenden's term Moorish, I think comes from, um, European ways of classifying North Indian Arab, North African Arab communities uh, during the period of um, the Spanish um, expulsion of, of, of Jews from the Spanish uh, mainland and the, the project of the Reconquista, um, the, the, the project of, as it were, taking back under Spanish control those areas which had been occupied by Arab communities of Northwest Africa. And in that era, and I suppose we're talking really about Shakespeare's time, you know, a, a, a word for any person of color, um, particularly any person who was obviously, uh, who was perhaps Arab or, or um, South Asian, Central South Asian was a Moor. Um, uh, I mean, there's a, a famous Shakespearean character who I'm embarrassed to say, I forget the name, um, uh, uh, who is described as a Moor. Um, so that just comes out of, it comes out of the systems of community classification of the time. <clears throat> Your second question um, about um, uh, resources. Um, of course, we on our side, think that we're very disadvantaged because after all we don't have access the kind of access to local archives that you do um, uh, you know if I if I wanted to work on some aspect of of Mughal India I would every time um, or of Mughal Maharashtra I would every time go to Pune because of course you have the Peshwa Dafta there uh, the state records of the, of the Peshwa era. Um, uh, and you also have um, uh, the, um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the wonderful library that was established by Rajwade uh, down in, um, so is it in Sadashivpet uh, in Pune, um, uh, the uh, Itihas Bharat, Itihas Sanshodak Mandal, um, which is an absolute treasure trove of writings on. Um, on Mughal uh, and 18th, 17th, 18th century Maharashtra. Um, <clears throat> now, of course, I'm, I'm answering here, Harshita, in relation, <coughs> excuse me, in relation in particular to the history of Maharashtra. Um, and um, I'm not sure whether you are a, a, a local person or your, uh, your um, uh, I'm not sure what you're, you're, where, where uh, you're located, um, but for anyone, for any historian who works on Maharashtra, um, you know we are we are thrice blessed 
partly because um, Maharashtra, and I think probably because of its very flourishing traditionalist class of Brahmin scribal specialists. Maharashtra, right from the, the early modern era and even before, was a society that kept records, that used paper. Um, and so a lot of those paper records have survived. Why have they survived? Um, they have survived um, uh, partly because um, uh, the Peshwai uh, was itself obsessively an obsessively record keeping kind of regime. It was very much a bureaucratic regime. Uh, but in particular, they have survived because of that, um, those extraordinary two or three generations. Of, of patriotic amateur historians that were active from about the 70, from about the 1890s through to the 1930s. People like Rajwade, people like, um, well, th there is a, a list of names that, you know, I, I, I could um, recount, but I won't. Um, people who um, were determined to patiently walk around, literally in some cases walk, around the small towns and the villages of Maharashtra, persuading families who would listen to please loan your family papers so that we can print them. So for anyone who wants to work on 17th or 18th century Maharashtra, there is a wealth of printed historical records, um, uh, not just of the original manuscripts, which you can find in Bharatiti Hassan Shodak Mandal, but in the publications of Rajwari um, and his, uh, his, the people who worked with him, uh, you know, Rajwari's politics, of course, did not bear close inspection from my point, you know, from, I think, a modern point of view. But there is no doubting the invaluable service he did in preserving these records. So I, I guess my answer, Harshita, is, um, you know, the grass is always greener on the other side. But in fact, before you say that, look more closely at the grass on your own side. And I think you will find some very green grass under your own feet. Um, thank you. Uh, who do we go to next? Um, mm. uh, uh, we have um, M. Vikas Kumar and Anne Mary and Harshita. Uh, okay, Vikas so, hasn't asked a question as yet. Uh, M. Vikas Kumar, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Professor, for the lectures. Uh, so my question is uh, in response to, uh, in addition to Path's question and also in, uh, in response to your uh, answer. So uh, when we assume that there is a plurality within uh, Hinduism, uh, mm -hmm. even before the colonial intervention, uh, mm -hmm. so I, I think that it, uh, the Hinduism, Hinduism already assumes a pluralistic, uh, uh, assumes that there are different sects or constituents which mm -hmm. form an overarching like you know umbrella uh, mm -hmm. called hinduism but since we have been discussing post colonial theory since yesterday so a lot mm -hmm. of post colonial uh, scholars uh, dispute that fact a fact that uh, hinduism uh, existed before colonial intervention the very uh, you know phrase ism is attached to it after the post colonial uh, intervention right so mm -hmm. before that like it is already assumed that there are uh, different pluralities but my question uh, or, or rather my curiosity is as to how do we understand those pluralities because those are very heterogeneous in nature so for example i come from the region called telangana in south india and uh, where uh, uh, in my caste which is a lower caste Dalit community like we have a different kind of religious practices as much as i've seen and learned from uh, the ancestral anecdotes and so on and also presently there is one festival that's going on in telangana which is also recognized as a state festival, but interestingly, it's a tribal festival uh, 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 of uh, where, like you know, offerings are uh, uh, things are offered to these two goddesses who are sisters, Samaka mm -hmm. and Saraka, and they are tribal women. So mm -hmm. they had died uh, while fighting for their land, for uh, land rights, forest rights, uh, against the British colonial officers of the time, and later became goddesses. And today, in today's time, it's a celebrated as a state festival. Uh, yeah. And interestingly, that religious site. It does not have a temple 
it's mm-hmm. in the middle of a forest with no uh, roof or anything as such it's just a totem two totems are there and people go and offer uh, you know uh, jaggery and other stuff who would, uh, which they think as they they uh, consider jaggery as gold in this mm-hmm. context so mm-hmm. hence jaggery so so there are plenty of traditions like that which had never fallen under the ambit of uh, hindu ritualistic practices even yes. the sacrificing of animals was a lower caste tradition it did not fall under the tradition of uh, you know brahmanical practice of uh, religion so uh, in such heterog- in the presence of a heterogeneity how far can we see hinduism or hindu practices as a plural plural uh, one uh, no i mean that's a very good question um um uh, and vikas kumar um uh and i i'm interested that um that state festival that you describe that there is not a temple there that there hasn't been any attempt to sort of incorporate it into more brana Bra- more brahmanic forms of hinduism which does often happen um uh, you know you'll find the sort of pujari who somehow been marginalized a temple has gone up and all of a sudden you have a pandit and but sort of rather different rituals. So it's interesting that 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 its its um, folk character has been preserved. Um, now, you know, in so what do we this term Hinduism? Well, you know, I think we are getting here in a tangle just about a word. Now, of course, the word Hinduism that which is a kind of an abstraction, a notion of Hinduism as as a unitary structure, as an omnibus, people call it an omnibus um, uh, construction. You know, of course, <clears throat> the word itself wasn't there in the 18th century. People started talking about isms. It's more of a kind of 19th and later century term. I mean, <clears throat> if we were to say, which I think is a perfectly reasonable alternative way, um, if we were to talk about a Hindu about the Hindu tradition, which I think these days is more what scholars would how scholars would describe it, um, and if you as soon as you as soon as you talk about something as a, as a tradition, you're kind of gesturing at something that isn't a unitary thing. Most traditions are, in the course of their historical construction have a have a diversity plural strands built into them um so i think you know the, the thing about uh, you know i'm thinking particularly about the, the the invention of hinduism debate i i think actually it's a lot a lot of uh, it's confusion really about an issue that shouldn't be confusing um what i mean there are two things i think that that give this whole debate an edge one of course is that historically and i'm not talking about present day times historically um what we might call brahmanic hinduism has long recognized that those rituals those goddesses um those charismatic places on the forest margins that you know where folk very often it's folk deities that are um celebrated that those charismatic sites are some of the most potent and fertile sources of religious power and so over many centuries there has always been a process and this will be I hardly need to mention this there has always been a process whereby more brahmanic forms of hinduism try to incorporate those sites and appropriate their charisma for its for, for, for those more more brahmanic dharma shastra focused purity focused forms of 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 uh, hindu practice so that, that i think is that's one of the an aspect of history that lends this discussion an edge the plurality of hinduism an edge the other the other thing is the modern day equivalent of those drives to appropriate incorporate 
which are of course which we see in our own times you know the the, the drives as it were to as it were convert some some tribal communities the targeting of <clears throat> some muslim communities as once hindus who should be brought back home uh, um, uh, brought back into the fold and of course those are very sensitive matters um, uh, in, in you know in for some people that is something which reduces hinduism's diversity it it associates dalit and pastoralist communities with with rather conservative forms of Hinduism in a way that closes down diversity, even though for some of those communities, it makes perfect sense to accept those practices if they come with, um, with access to education, access to, to particular kinds of resources. So I think, um, uh, Mr. Kumar, th those are the things which give this issue a particular edge in the present. Um, I think the debate over it was Hinduism invented in the 19th century. I really don't think that's a real debate. Um, I mean, it's, a, it's a distraction that isn't ultimately very helpful. Um, I hope you will forgive that. Um, so where are we going now? Uh, Harshita, are we going with you? Um, hello, ma'am. Uh, good morning, Professor Hanlon. Um, so my question was that uh, we were discussing today about Cohen's work and one of these ideas that he talks about uh, the relation between language and power and he traces it through the colonial period. Uh, so I was reading this work by Ahmed Ali called uh, The Twilight in, uh, of Delhi. Uh, and Ali was a very established Urdu novelist before he wrote this uh, work in English. And it's sort of curious that why he would choose to write a novel which is so deeply uh, Urdu in its content and its usage uh, in English. So I was curious that, that when we talk about such sort of literature sources that emerge in the colonial and post-colonial world, uh, when they transgress from a language in which they're so well established as authors uh, to mm -hmm. English, uh, what does it tell us about uh, the construction of that particular novel? I mean, how do we contextualize it within this larger question of language and power and what kind of inversion is at play here? Well, I don't know the work, I'm afraid. Um, and so I, I can't give you really very informed answers. I, I think the only thing I would say is, um, first, that the history of Urdu as a language, of course, is, you know, I, I don't speak or read Urdu, but I have friends who work very seriously on it. And many of you will know uh, the great um, literary tradition that we have there in Urdu. Um, but also that Urdu has, has this extraordinary history. It has a history of, uh, you know, it's a kind of, it's, it's a history of indigenization in the pre-colonial era. Um, it, it, it's a history in which um, Urdu is sometimes associated with agendas of, of purification. We, we should purify Urdu, um, you know, we, of, of, uh, uh, of words that don't belong to Muslim communities. Sometimes Urdu is the object of other people's agendas of purification. You know, if, if you look at, um, of course, the, the language question in later uh, 19th century India and the drive to construct a language called Hindi, which was purified of its Perso Arabic words. Um, so, you know, Urdu, I don't need to tell you this, has this wonderful complex and kind of politically charged history in the Indian subcontinent, in, in India and, and the South Asian subcontinent. Um, uh, now, the decision to write in English, um, you would have to look at the author to understand that. Um, I mean, the, the pull of writing in English, there are pools to write, want to write in English. You get a, a different audience. You know, English is a global language. Um, there are local varieties of English. Um, you know, there is a language that uh, we call Hinglish, um, kind of which I'm sure some of you will recognize. Um, uh, but of course, if you choose to write in English, there are things which is then much more difficult to say because of course a language is so much more than words. You know, languages are sentiments, languages are deep 
attachment, deep forms of attachment. Um, that there are things not only which it's hard to say, which, but which are almost hard to think, or hard at least to feel, if not hard to think. Um, so all I can, you know, the decision to, to, to write in English is a, I'm quite sure that author will have thought very long and carefully, and you might be able to find the answer to that question in the introduction to the book. Um, but, you know, these questions of language are very deep and very profound. Um, uh, so thank you, Harshita. Uh, Anna-Marie, please go ahead. Thank you, Professor. Uh, my question was regarding Pinter's article. Uh, in the article towards the end, uh, he makes the statement that the tension between the relationship, the tension that occurred between the relationship of Jahangir and Ro uh, was not was not just because they were European and the other being Indian, but it was more in relation to the social relations that were created. So my mm -hmm. question was, uh, uh, isn't the social relations a part or a result of uh, one being a European and the other being Indian, in the sense that, as you also mentioned earlier, that even when EIs, uh, the East India Company had come to India, even when they did not have a blueprint about India, they knew that they were soon going to be an empire. Or uh, something I discussed the other day regarding uh, how uh, we were, the European Enlightenment ideas were transformed to India, but the idea was that we were not ready yet. So, um, so isn't there a power dynamic already created, and or, and this power dynamics is a creation of one being a European and the other being an Indian? So, in that case, can we say that uh, the social relations should be studied devoid of seeing the one being European and the other being Indian? Uh, I hope I may. I hope I may make sense. Yeah. Um, thank you for that question, uh, Anne Maria. It's a, a good and in, insightful question. Um, I think to say that communication is possible does not mean that that power is absent. Of course, it isn't. Um, uh, um, yeah, in all of these questions, there is a in, in all of these relationships, there is a there is a dynamic of power. Um, I mean, in the case of Roe, in that immediate case, on the one hand, um, you know, we had a situation, we have a situation where British, um, the, the, where um, British seafaring skills, um, British um, determination to expand its networks of trade had brought Roe to the Mughal court. Now, there was not, you know, if you're, if you're I think a, something to understand about this early modern era is that it's an era in which the balance of advantage, longer term advantage, is shifting away from the great land-based um, empires to maritime states. The world that was coming into being gave advantage to the people who had command of the sea, who knew how to use the sea to communicate to tra for trade, for military purposes, for exploration. Now, of course, um, the Mughals, I mean, this is another, if I can point this out without <laughs> appearing um, to biased in my, my favor, my uh, favoring of the uh, Maharashtra's history. Of course, one of the, the things that, that the Chhatrapati Shivaji did was to attempt to start his own fleet. He saw which he saw this movement of, of advantage very gradually away from the great agrarian empires, India, China, the Ottomans, um, uh, to states that could control the sea, the Dutch, the English, the Spanish, the Portuguese, maritime states. So on the one hand, the fact that Roe is in, is in Mughal India and rather than a Mughal ambassador making his way to London is a reflection of that 
gradually shifting balance of power towards maritime states. But if you were to say to Roe himself, you know, you're really the powerful player in this setting, he would not have said, oh, yes, I am. He would have said, you must be joking. You know, I'm, I'm absolutely in a horrible place. On the one hand, I have these directors of the East India Company who refuse to give me sufficient funds to maintain a dignified uh, 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 presence at the Mughal court and who've sent me out with these miserable gifts that make a mockery of me in front of everybody here at the court. Um, uh, and I'm daily subject to, you know, being told you, you must wait, take your place at the back of the queue. So I think this is another aspect of, th th that we have to remember if we are studying history over the short and the long term, which is that, and this again is a very obvious thing to say, that history has short-term situations and history has these long-term unwinding of particular dynamics of change. And that gradual shift of power from land, great land-based land agrarian empires to maritime states took two or three centuries to unfold. But I think it was, uh, one never likes to say something is inevitable as a historian, because if it was, then you're out of a job. You know, one is always exploring the conditionalities, um, the, the contingencies, the what might have beens. Um, so, you know, on the one hand, you know, looking back, with the benefit of hindsight, we can see that um, Sir Thomas Rowe, you know, was riding the tide that would eventually bring colonialism to India's shores. But if you were to ask Rowe himself, you know, how are you feeling? He'd say, I, you know, the position is hopeless. Um, you know, my masters are too mean to send me out with decent presents. I struggle to get a, an audience. So do, do you see what I mean? That I think the long, the the the, uh, the long durée and the immediate are different kinds of historical analysis for us, and we need both. I hope that makes sense. Um, yes, Professor. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, now, um, uh, uh, are there interest? Are there questions? Are there questions? Observations? Um, we have about ten minutes left. Anyone, um, I don't know any, whether in the chat box that there are questions perhaps from yesterday that we should ask, or that we should take up, mm -hmm. uh, or um, whether there there's are- a, There's a question from Chinmay. Ah, Chinmay. Please go ahead, Chinmay. Yeah, yeah. So uh, if from the slide seven, uh, the one where uh, you spoke about the materiality and a sense of spirit, the uh, positions of Cohn versus that of uh, Valleys. Yeah. Uh, I was reminded of what uh, Pamuk says, uh, Orhan Pamuk in his Norton lectures. Uh, he quote, he gives an example of Marcel Duchamp's uh, ready-mades, uh, mm -hmm. the work of arts, which are kind of the things that were circulated in the second decade of the 20th century mm -hmm. uh, to decorate one's living room. So mm -hmm. my question is, if we look at the uh, languages in India, mm -hmm. uh, and if we uh, put them against this idea of like typical uh, duality of modernity versus modernism that they make, uh, what you just said that words are not, uh, language is not just words, where perhaps you refer to the materiality of language mm -hmm. uh, as against what lies uh, is the spirituality of language. Mm -hmm. So uh, in that sense, what are the uh, spiritual aspects of modernism that uh, have come from the um, pre-colonial times, which we still have? One of them is, of course, religion and mm -hmm. the uh, spirituality that we have. Mm -hmm. But what could be such more of such instances, which uh, as historians, as sociologists, as linguists, we can... Well, um, 
when you say <clears throat> when you say modernism, Chinmay, uh, um, that of course is a is a slightly different term. Uh, you know, um, modernism is one would usually is, and I'm not an expert in this field, but uh, modernism is is a kind of an a literary aesthetic artistic movement of 20 of the 20th century by my focus has been on the idea of modernity and the idea of early modernity as uh, so so one can see modernism as a literary artistic movement uh, 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 whereas modernity i think of as a state of the world a state of connectedness, whether it's early modern or, or our own present day modernity, that it is a state of interconnectedness. So um, if you're asking um, what were the implications of, um, of early modernity for language, well, um, you know, one of the things to point out here um, is India's really quite unique language environment. As, as many of you will know, this is a, a world, this is a genuinely multilingual world in which most people would have access obviously to a mother tongue, but some limited familiarity with either with what we call cosmopolitan languages, either Sanskrit or Persian. Um, uh, and um, this is also a world, don't forget, of exceptional fluidity between language and script. It's not till the coming of print that um, particular languages develop a fixed script. Um, so, you know, I can write um, Sanskrit, I, I can write... Um, uh, uh, I can write Sanskrit, I was going to say in Marathi script, I could write Sanskrit, Sanskrit in Malayalam script. Um, so the, 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 um, what we in our era of print take absolutely for granted that every language ha has a print form, a fixed print form, that didn't exist in the pre-colonial era. And of course, part, I mean, something that we're going to be dealing with next week um, uh, not in, in, in a, at least in a tangential way, are the consequences of the coming of print into India. Um, and the, the, with the coming of print, of course, you get much more of a fixity in, ling in forms of vernacular language. Um, so um, that's to say a standardization, because you can't, you, if you want to use print, you have to have a standardized grammar and you have to have a standardized script because you can't, otherwise print doesn't work. Um, and there are, I mean, a question which has long puzzled um, many observers is why in India, when the technology of print had been known since the 16th century, the technology was known, but it was never adopted. Um, it wasn't, it was only adopted uh, very late and really um, initially at least under colonial auspices, although very, very quickly, um, Indian communities, Indian agencies took over print and made it their own project. Um, so the question is why, why was print not known? Why was print not adopted? Why didn't the Mughals adopt print? And I think you would have to argue, you would have, you might suggest that two or three answers. Uh, one is why would you need print? You have any number of scribes at your command who will work cheaply, who will copy things out and they can copy it out in any script you like, in any language you like. So print is not such a great technology, I'm afraid. Uh, we don't need it. Um, that may be one reason that this, you know, that this immensely fluid world of languages and um, scripts was useful. It was, it was, it facilitated communication. Another reason uh, why I think print was not adopted earlier in India 
was a sense that information was valuable. Why would you just go giving it away to anybody? Whether it's commercial information, information about your family, um, information about property. Um, these, these are not just to be broadcast to the world. We, 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 want, we want them to keep them within our communities. So I, I think, uh, so it's not a very good answer to your question, uh, Chinmay, in, in a sense, your question was rather a broad one. Um, you know, the, the chief, I think one of, one of the chief consequences of the move from the early modern to the colonial is, is this loss of the, the hugely fluid world of, um, uh, of, uh, pre, uh, of the multilingual world. It's not that people stopped speaking different languages or being familiar with them, but that the arrival of print meant a great standardization and a loss of flexibility and also the privileging of, um, of some types of language over others. Um, some styles of writing, some literary registers uh, uh, and so on. Um, now, uh, where are we next? Where are we now? Uh, you have your hand up, Shraddha. Yeah, uh, question from me in the chat box. Mm -hmm. Uh, eight minute. Uh, Jatin, Jatin. Uh, ah, question from Shraddha. Thank you. As historians, sometimes we write things that go against the popular common sense image of historical personalities. How does one answer without sounding like an academic gatekeeper and with the kind of humility you mentioned yesterday? Um, of course, personalities are tremendously important to us in history. Um, they, uh, they're important to us in the present day because for most people, we associate with the past through particular personalities who are meaningful to us. Um, also, whilst I am not an advocate of the great man or great woman theory of history, I do think there have been personalities which if they simply hadn't been there, it's hard to see things working out in quite the same way. Sometimes a unique kind of personality and the way that they resonate in a particular situation just shifts the direction, I think, of the historical process. Um, so what do you say when somebody says to you this wonderful person and uh, you know I'm how can I um, how can uh, how do we how do we look at great personalities um, in a way which is both historically informed but also respectful respectful of the person in front of us as well as appropriately of the personality well I think the best way to do this um, is contextualization um, because nobody can object to that. Nobody can object to our, our saying that of, of some great historical personage, the best way to, to gain a really full understanding of this important person is to look at the context that they came from. Whereas wh 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 whether that is a family context, a religious context, an institutional context, um, everybody gains if we understand, if we spread that understanding of what, how did this person, how can we understand them against their context? Um, and understanding the context of someone, I think you are then halfway to a conversation. Um, and that's to my, in my eyes, is, is what we are aiming for, is a conversation in which the different sides learn from each other. Um, if I'm if I'm talking to someone, I, I mean we're speaking of Maharashtra here, so what better person to speak of than the Chhatrapati himself? Um, it would, you know, I have had many conversations, often in the backs of rickshaws, about Shivaji. The rickshaw while I will say to me, "What are you doing here?" And I will say, "Well, I'm not a tourist. I am researching the history of Maharashtra." And the question will be, well, what aspect of history? So 
I would I would usually say I'm looking at the life and times of Chhatrapati Shivaji, and in recent years that has been true because I've been working on early modern India. And it is always interesting to me what aspect, you know, normally, of course, the rickshaw driver will be very pleased. You come all this way to study this most important person in our history. And I will say, yes, it's, it's very clear that they were very important. And then that rickshaw driver will tell me, usually would tell me what he believes about Shivaji and what he understands about the tradition. And that is always useful. It's useful because in part, it, it, uh, it will draw your attention to some aspect of the tradition that you have overlooked. Um, it will draw your attention to present day sensibilities, obviously. Um, uh, and very often it will, you know, if you probe a little bit, it will, you will learn something um, about the, the, the culture of the period or the culture of, of Maratha identity um, that you hadn't thought of before or that this is putting it in a new light. Um, so, you know, anyone who, you know, who is on this, who is, comes from history one and is talking to history two, the very last thing that you should do is say to them, now, look, you've got this all wrong. You know, I'm a proper historian and let me tell you, you've got it wrong. Absolutely not. You have far more to gain by listening. Um, listening is hard and I myself am not a very good listener because I like to talk too much, which you would have noticed. Um, uh, but I think that would be uh, context and then and then listening in ask for ask for views ask how it is you think like that how it is how did you what was your journey to arrive at this position when did you first notice these things uh, and so on so I hope Shraddha that is a little bit of a pointer towards your um your uh, question there um, thank you So um, we'll, I yeah, uh, I think uh, the questions are also over and the time as well. This um, five minutes ahead uh, of right. It's five uh, six minutes past five. So okay, if you want to say something, <laughs> um, any uh, um, if if the, there are no other questions, um, we should perhaps move on. If you, very welcome to bring up things from today tomorrow. Um, because the whole point of this as a week is to is to have a continuing conversation, um, to make connections. Because the pro the problem with one off seminars is you know it's a kind of instant in time, and then you go away and you think, hmm, I wonder how that works. And uh, so pl please do think of it in think of our conversations in this way. Um, so, um, uh, Shraddha, I will send you a quick WhatsApp message just um, confirming that we're on for tomorrow in the normal way. Um, and uh, those of you who are um, on the Zoom call, I do thank you very much indeed for your excellent questions and your patience. Um, and um, those of you on the, on the YouTube channel, um, uh, please do keep your questions coming in um, and join the conversation, um, uh, uh, whether it be about yesterday or, or today's classes. And, I look forward to our discussions, further discussions tomorrow at the same time. And I think the Zoom, the Zoom link and the YouTube link will be sent out uh, in due course, won't they, Stradlach?